I know. No, but you don't have that to us yet. Well, I'll get it. But we'll play it, but and we'll also play the uh, the uh, destruction of Atlantis. We'll do that in the May concert. Mm -hmm. In fact, I may even write out some string parts for that, since we have some string players that want to play with us. But we'll get that. We'll get well, that. I run into an orchestration that I had. I didn't know I had. If Pierre again sweet, it's an Three. orchestration. All right. You want it? Yes. Well, I don't want it. I don't need it. It's a full orchestration. We'll, we'll play First it. First violin part I have played it on the fiddle, but then long down the road. So it was 1921. You met Madame uh, Schumann Hank. Yes, I met her. And she sang the piccolo part. The stars, stars and stripes. Yes, sir, and she sang it perfect. <laughs> Tell Joe the story, if you don't mind telling it again, about the day you had the hungover trombone player on the parade field that kept marching. <laughs> that was kind of funny, still funny. Joe, Mr. Ray has a story he wants to tell. I yeah, he did. No, I told him about it. I was in the Marine Corps. We were close to Tijuana, Mexico, you know, and some of the boys used to go down. Of course, I didn't ever take anything like that myself. But uh, I'd go down and take care of the boy. Anyway, <laughs> we, had, we had a trombone player old Reggie Ross. He, and one Monday morning we was playing Jordan Mount and Reggie had been down to see one of the night before that he could play about a good drunk more more so than a lot of things that good sober. And we were playing several fidelis and that did 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 dump bump but then, <laughs> and we trooped the line and Reggie didn't see us. And he went marching off out up across the field, yeah, after breathing out the trombone. He was fifty yards out there before he told us he didn't have any bad. <laughs> oh, that was oh. pretty funny. Mr. Ray, what's your full name? Charles Jefferson. Ray R H E A. R H E A. Yeah. Yeah. Where are you from originally? Oh well, I was born in Idaho. <laughs> but I my mother died when I was just a small kid, and my dad was, uh, he was formerly a Texan. Mm -hmm. He was raised out there a couple of miles where I live now. When were you born? I was born in Weezer, Idaho. Well, 1897. What day? 14th of April. I just had a birthday the other day. When did you get started with music? Oh, good God. <laughs> I started trying to play a trumpet or a cornet in about 12. About 14 years old. Did you go to school? Did you uh, have any formal music training? No. No, well, I had a little, not a great deal. Well, I had a had a good friend that was uh, he was a band director. After I got up, you know, quite a bit, and I uh, I got quite a lot of instruction from him. That he just playing with him more than anything else, but he he showed me a lot of stuff. Yeah. And then I spent several years coaching the fifth grade main band out there, and then I've been in that shrine band for about. Well, about four years. When did you start collecting all this sheet music? Pardon? When did you start collecting your library? When oh, I've been collecting that for 50 years. But How this, you get this big library, than most of what he's got, you see, uh, I had a good friend, he's a World War One but two, he's a major. He was a professional musician, and uh, he was in World War One, and he had this big library, and he donated it to Sram Band. But our director, uh, he was a young fella, and he did, wouldn't play it much. He claimed that uh, he didn't have enough parts for it. Of course, most of those arrangements were made for smaller bands back in those days. And I told him, I had a pretty good library, and I told him that I would take this stuff home and catalog it and add mine to it, and then he'd have enough parts. Well, I did. I worked on six more. I took it back, and he decided then he didn't need it. So I had it, so I wasn't going to throw it away, and I just kept it. That's how come he with it. Mm -hmm. Right. So uh, I've been looking for somebody to, some band to give it to, and I run into this guy here, and he, he, uh, I had what he wanted, and, and he wanted what I had. So <laughs> what'd you all meet, John? What'd you all? Almost three years ago, the Guthrie City Band uh, took a trip to Granbury, Texas. We wanted to study the restoration of the town. Guthrie wasn't that far along, and we wanted to see what they did and how they did it frankly, to see how their Arts Council had succeeded so well. So we took with us a small city band, played a concert in the square, and after it was over, uh, a lady said, there's a gentleman over here in the far bench who would like to meet you. And I went out there and I was introduced to Mr. Ray, and he said, do you all need some music? I said, well, we always need music. He said it was unusual to find young people, or people our age, that played that older literature so well and played it like we enjoyed it. 
not just hammering notes, but as if we loved it, which we did. So to shorten the story up, he took us out to his house, which was stacked, we were falling all over, boxes and boxes of the rarest, most beautiful music ever written. Then takes me out to his well house and says, well, you can have any of that you want. And of course, it's just ceiling to floor. And I take down the first three or four boxes. And there's complete double sets of everything Carl King ever wrote in Paris Chambers and First Edition Sousa and Victor Herbert and Rudolf Fremel and name it. And it's there. So uh, Mr. Ray started, uh, we started corresponding and he started shipping me music. And uh, turns out that uh, some of us uh, wanted to make a trip back to Granbury anyway, and we decided to take the band with us. And we were also going to coordinate that with an award ceremony for Mr. Ray. So we went down there last March, 16th of 83, and performed again on the square, this time a much larger group. And uh, Mr. Ray was awarded a degree from the University of Oklahoma at Guthrie, Doctor of Music degree, in fact. And uh, we uh, loaded up some more music and took it back, and we decided right then he needed to come up here and play with us for 89ers. And uh, now all I need to do is figure out the next dates. Mm -hmm. But that's the story. Hmm. Okay. A chance meeting then. Yes, it Actually, was. a chance meeting. <laughs> and that first group I took down there was awfully small. I mean, I think like I had 12 people, mm -hmm. but they were 12 good ones. So all the parts were covered. And it worked. I was about getting the most out of them that could be gotten out of a small group like that. How did you collect most of the sheet music over the years? Well, uh, I got, oh, I, I knew, I uh, lived in Waco down there. I had a dance band down there quite a while, and I knew uh, a professional musician down there. Well, I, my piano player used to play, she was a great big gal that beat up door, but she could play piano. She used to play for the silent movies, and she played piano for me. And she could play anything in the world you can name. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, most of it we played by ear on that. We just, you know. But then I, I played in the band down there, that National Guard band down there, and I played in it. And uh, I just, you know, started collecting uh, this uh, this guy, this this fellow that used to play for, uh, well, his wife played for uh, uh, Silent Movies. He was a professional violinist. And uh, I got to playing with him. I played a little fiddle there. And we got, we'd have a jam session over his house every once in a while. His wife played piano, and we'd have a good, had a lot of fun. And so I got a lot of music. They had a big library, and so they gave me a whole bunch of it. And I bought some of it, and I just, you know, collected the first one, and then another. And then I had a good friend that was, a, he was a bandmaster, a fellow named Andrews, there at Granbury. And he, he died, and he had a pretty good library, and his, his, uh, his uh, sister-in-law, he wasn't married, his sister-in-law gave me his, his library. Well, it wasn't uh, nothing like this last library I got, but like I say, the, uh, this old man, that this, this uh, major that donated this music to the Shrine Van, that's where the book of this come, came from. With all this heavy stuff, this big stuff, that's where nearly all of that came from. Well, I had a few big numbers, but, uh, but it didn't, I didn't buy it. I, I bought some of it, I didn't buy this. But this uh, library he had, I didn't let him get close to anything, and I wasn't going to. Or someone said, you can sell it and get a lot of money out of it. I said, I don't need a lot of money. It didn't cost me. I just want somebody to, to take it, to enjoy it, and play it. And that's what that's what he's doing. And I'm just tickled to death that he'd get it. You know, it's, uh, most of it didn't cost me. I don't suppose I was out $500 on the whole world. But this library that Major Davis, donated to the Shrine Band down there. He told me himself that about an $8,000 library at that time. And uh, Lord knows what it would be worth now. Because a lot of those numbers, like, well, John knows, a lot of those numbers you couldn't even find. A lot of that big stuff. John, when did you start the Capital City Band? Well, we had a city band here before, strictly volunteer, with all of the advantages and limitations of a volunteer group. But now that the Arts Council in Guthrie is going so big, we have a concert series here, and tourism and everything. The Historical Society and the Arts Council wanted a city band, and they wanted one that was good. So they asked me to recruit, and it seemed to me the logical place to start was some of my friends at Central State University. Many of them live here anyway, and it's not that far away. Uh, so I put some feelers out, and did some recruiting and some auditioning, 
And uh, sure enough, showed up with 25 people that were very interested in doing this kind of literature. Incidentally, the ones I have are all the ones that are in every other group already. They're the ones that are completely committed and always find time for one more extracurricular activity. Uh, I got the best ones, as you heard today. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're sponsored by the City of Guthrie Arts Council. And uh, we're three fixed days a year we're to play up here. We're to play Fourth of July, Statehood Day, and 89ers Day without any variation in a fourth floating day, which will be our May-June thing. And then uh, we're going to send out some publicity kits to every arts council in the state and every local historical society and advertise to play concerts in the park, balls, Veterans Day, Decoration Day, summer evening concerts, whatever, and uh, see if we can't get us a tour put together. But that's the story of the band, and uh, it's a, kind of a symbol of Guthrie's renaissance. Mr. Ray, when did you join the Marines? Oh, I joined the Marines first time. See, I did two hitches in the Marines, bro. I joined the Marines during World War One, in the spring of 1918. Mm -hmm. And uh, I went to boot camp at Forest Island, South Carolina. And, uh, of course, I wasn't in the band then. i have been playing in the hometown band, but I wasn't in the band up there. And I went overseas, went over there, and after the war was over, and I got out of the hospital, I got buggered up over there. I got a dose of gas. Anyway, I went to the hospital, I was there quite a while, and after I got out of the hospital, my outfit, the uh, war was over, and uh, my outfit had done moved up into Germany, and I did uh, get back to them when we, uh, the foreign marine guard companies out of us, uh, as much as had come out of the hospital. And uh, we were back in southern France, and uh, so uh, we organized a, a dance band back there. And uh, I played in that thing until we came to the States. I've got, I've got my old trumpet that I brought from France. <laughs> what, uh, if you wouldn't mind talking about it, which areas did you serve in in the war? No, we were, I got, we hit there in, uh, in the summer of 1918 and we weren't there but just a few Oh, just a few days we shoved on the front. I was in three major drives. Which which drive? Which one? Saint Mahill and Champagne and the Argonne. What'd you do in the Marines? What, what was your job? I was a butt private in the Marine in uh, number three in the rear rank. <laughs> I never did. No, anyway. then I shipped over when I was on the west coast and I was yeah. band all the time out there. Can you tell me what the inside of a trench is like? Well, what, we what, just, what did it look like? Well, we just did, uh, when I was over there. We had them kind of on the run and just dig a long, long trench and big enough to get in. That is, some of them as deep as that door, some of them not quite so deep. Mm -hmm. <laughs> did you line the inside of them with anything? Or just no, dirt? we didn't have, I know they did. Some of the, uh, we captured some of the German trenches over there. They had lived in them for two or three years. We, uh, there in Blankmont Ridge, where we got booted up so bad, they'd been in there four years. They'd been there ever since the war started. What's the like to go over the top? Sir? What's it like to go over the top? Well, it isn't funny. <laughs> well, of course, now we put in, the, we had uh, the first one we was in, St. Mahil, we had a barrage, you know what a barrage is. There was a, the artillery put us over a barrage, and we didn't uh, meet a great deal of opposition until we run out of that barrage, and then we began to run into a scattered machine gun. But the St. Mahil was, it did, we didn't lose very many men in there, but the Blankmont Ridge, it was, uh, it was a set, of course, it's blank as white, you know, there's a bunch of white cliffs, there's a bunch of hills that the Germans held ever since the war started. And they had artillery all in, out all of the vantage points, you know, that you're attacking there, where they had it covered. And uh, the French had tried to take that place four times when they couldn't take it, and they sicked us on it. And we took it and they took us. <laughs> we got in there and got surrounded. We were in there about 12 days. It wasn't hardly anybody left. Is that where you got gas? Sir? Is that where you got the gas? Yes, I got it. I got it a little later than that, and, but uh, I didn't go to the hospital until all oh, the uh, first of We got into the Argonne Drive the first of November, and I did. I went to the hospital about the fourth or fifth. I took flu on top of it. I had that old gas coat and took flu on it. That's what everybody was dying of the flu, you know. I went to the hospital from the Oregon. I never did. I was in the hospital when the war was over. Mm -hmm. What was? What did you all do in Armistice Day when the war ended? Well, 
we went to town. I, I was able to. I was in a in a in the hospital. I didn't. We didn't do anything. wasn't able to do much. We had a little old village down at uh, close to Switzerland, Alloway. We went to town, and well, I say we. I didn't. Uh, and some of the boys went and they brought back a few bottles of wine. <laughs> we had a little party. <laughs> Of course, nobody got drunk or anything, and didn't have enough money to get drunk. Yeah. When did you join the Marine Band? I played trumpet. I played uh, trumpet, and, and I played the gate Marine Band. Uh, when did you join it? 22. 20, uh, 22. So have you been a professional musician then? No. What kind of work did you do? I was in the railroad. I was retired out of the railroad and mail service out of Fort Worth. Yeah. In the post office department, mm -hmm. railroad and mail service. Mm -hmm. No, uh, I, oh, I played with a lot of professionals. We've got, in the Shrine Band there, we've got a half a dozen band directors in there. That, uh, and then uh, I played, uh, well, I had a dance band. I played in the dance band overseas after I got out of the hospital. And uh, after the, uh, well, after the war was over in the spring of uh, 1919, I didn't get back here until 1919. We had a dance band there. And, some of those little boys were professionals, so I played with them, but I never, I never didn't have a union for that. Hmm. I just like to play. What was the name of the dance band? Sir? What was the name of the dance band you had overseas? Did it have a name? No. No, it was just a bunch of us 11 next that we got together out of different bands, and we, we, uh, we a lot of times, didn't have any music. <laughs> we had a good piano player. We had a we had a good piano player, and uh, then they had a couple of violinists that were really good. They were professional. Yeah. The guys uh, that got boogered up in the hospital. However, the violin players, they weren't, uh, one of them, he was an army man. But, uh, he was a big, big classification camp there, and we just got together. We played those dances around, you know, over the territory. We had a little fun. We didn't get anything out of it, of course. Yeah. Uh, besides, Madam Schumann Hyde, did you meet any other? Yeah, I met her. I talked to her. I've oh. seen her time with her. What was she like, Madam Schumann? Well, Schumann's she's a great big gal. She's a great big, heavy set. I bet she weighed a whale or two in her pound. She was big. She talked broken. She, was, she lived out of Grossmount, at, uh, out of San Diego. There. And but there's a big plaque there in front of the water that's still there. See, we played a concert up at that Belleville Park. It's with that big outdoor organ. At that time, it was the biggest outdoor organ in the world. We played a concert up there every Monday night, and she was always out to hear us. And there's a big plaque there uh, commemorating her. That is, the, the, well, there's two or three plaques there. She, she's uh, one of them. Mm -hmm. Talking uh, about her, her, she lived there. I guess she died. Mm -hmm. Ever meet uh, like Gala Kirchi or Capizani? No, I never people? did. She's the only big. Well, now this uh, V.F. Symphonic I was talking to John about, he was a noted composer. He wrote this Atlantis and a lot of other stuff by the Quinn of him. He lived out there. Yeah. And, uh, oh, I, uh, oh, I met uh, old Philip Sousa and all that. He came, he was making a tour. He came there and, uh, of course, he was getting old. Right? And he didn't do much directing. He was getting pretty well crippled up, but he had a good band. He was, he was on the train. He made, made a trip on the tour of the country on the train. And we met his, we met his train and played one of his marches. Yeah. What was he like, John Phillips? Well, he was old then. Uh, I didn't I didn't get to talk to him. I just yeah. met him. What year was that? Sir? What year was that? I was 20, I don't know, twenty twenty two or 20, 23, something like that. Mm -hmm. he, he was making a tour of the I don't know where all they were going, but they had a, well, I don't really, I, I guess he had a special train. They came in to say, uh, San Diego, and we met him with the train and played one of his marches. And mm -hmm. he got off the train. And yeah. of course, with that he had a wonderful man. Hmm. Um, no, I never did, I never did, uh, I didn't talk to him. I just, uh, we met him and all that. And that. No, he was real old then. He was pretty shaky. He, he couldn't, uh, he didn't do much directing. He, he, he couldn't lift his arms. He just kind of wave the baton around. Of course, they played too much. They could play without him, of course. <laughs> uh, hmm. yeah. um, oh, Schumann Knight was a wonderful person. Everybody loved her. Yeah. I guess she loved everybody.
Any more? Not for the moment. I want to show Mr. Ray a couple of photos. Yeah. Yeah, one more back then on this uh, nothing else I can say except the only thing that will come close to it, in my knowledge, is the Howard Tilton Memorial Library at Tulane University in New Orleans. Mm -hmm. They're into early jazz, cakewalk, and ragtime. And they're much larger than we're going to be, but we can always grow. But this will be a very significant, rare collection. And as soon as the three way catalog is completed, it will be published. Can you, uh, would you have any use for all of those fox trots and all that stuff that uh, I'm sending you? You could sort them out. Some of them yes. you could use, I guess. Some of them probably you couldn't. Know. Some of those fox trots, is, some, of the, <laughs> some of those, my cold medicine, some of those fox trots go real well as straight marches. Yeah, yeah. Well, you, well they, uh, a lot of them are labor one step or a march or something right. like that, you know. Right, but well now, uh, did, did I get that second Hungarian rafted to you? No, don't have it either. Well, I've still got it. I've got I've got a box or two there at the house. I guess in that. Now the two boxes that Mary's yet that you haven't got. Oh, there's about uh, there's several boxes up, and I haven't even gone up to Norman to pick up yet. I haven't had a chance. Well, now she's got. Now we brought some of it, but she's got. Two, uh, she's got two three boxes there yet. I don't know how many. And I've got two full boxes, and I've got uh, quite a bit more that I haven't got sorted out there to now. Okay. I'll, I'll get them to you. All right. But now there's a, there's a second Hungarian Rhapsody, and there's a fifth. I believe there's a fifth, isn't there? I think I went into it. And, uh, that, you, did I get that Mark Slav to you? Have you run into it? I think I've got Mark Slav. I think you've got that to us already. I think well, it's I want to, but yeah. I didn't. Yeah. It's a wonderful number. You, you get a kick out of <coughs> Did you see I, uh, the posters that the museum printed for us? No. Advertising today's concert? That's pretty handsome. <laughs> and here is the official 89er celebration program. And right there in the middle, they gave us an entire page. Now that's the 1907 Capital City Band. No, no. And this they didn't, didn't have any reeds at all, did they? Well, they've got some clarinets over here. Yeah, I see. Two or three Albert System clarinets, I'm guessing. <laughs> E-flat tuba and B-flat tuba, it looks like. Mm -hmm. And tenor horn. Probably sounded pretty rich. A little on the thick side, maybe but they could have been real good. Yeah, the first first band I played in didn't, we didn't have any, any reason. Had three trumpets, uh, three cornets rather, right. probably, and, and one old bass, and uh, I did about a dozen of them. We played uh, when they uh, dedicated that statue to General Granberry down there. Yes. I guess I'm the only guy living that played up right, right out in front of that thing. I remember that. We played a whole bunch of the old patriotic areas, you know, America, and Columbia, the gem of the ocean, and all that. <laughs> <laughs> Must have been quite a day. That was, what, 1916 or so? No, before then, the 19, it was about 1912 or 14, somewhere along there. <laughs> yeah, we, yeah, there was about, about a dozen of us right there. We had, we had two trumpets, I believe, or two cornets, and we had a one trombone and bass, and a bass and drum and a snare, and didn't have any, didn't have any horn. And I forget what, what else we had. And of course, didn't have no saxes. There were no saxes back in those days. Yeah. And, uh, I think it was about 12, 14 days. All right. So I was talking to uh, one of the girls there, one of the women there in town. She didn't. She didn't, she wasn't old enough to remember it, but then, uh, what is this, uh, uh, Mary, Mary Lou Watkins, did you sure. were? Sure, I know Mary Lou. And I don't think yeah. she was there. Well, she might have been, I don't know. I don't think she was old enough then. But I know she was never coming, you know, and said, you're the only one left. I said, yeah, I guess I am. I don't know any of the rest of them alive. <laughs> but we, I was just a kid, and we played out in front of that thing. Hmm. Yeah, I think that's a nice did, he say, did you say anything about John Philip Sousa coming out there and you met him? Yeah. Okay. Did you tell him about that? Well, I just, I just we played for We played uh, one of his marches, played uh, El Capitan as he's getting off the train. <laughs> Marine band? Yeah. Yes. 
Yeah, well, I say met him. He he had come around, shook hands with a few of us, but then I I didn't talk to him or anything like that. He was old, didn't he? Well, in his, in his directing, he couldn't he couldn't raise his arms. Yeah, I know. He toward the end, kind of swing it this way. Yeah, I'm just didn't tell him that's about all he did. Yeah. Of course, I was telling him they they could have played it without his directing at all. That punch he had. Boy, he he played uh, oh. Uh, a trumpet solo, one of his trumpet players played a trumpet solo, one of them. Oh, it was a Lulu going that triple tongue in business. Boy, he could sing that. I've got a book about Sousa right here I've just been reading. Yeah. Well, he looked, he looked about like that. Yeah. I'm uh, going to talk to Kerr McGee, you know, the big oil company, mm -hmm. and Santa Fe Railroad. They have both asked if there's any way they could possibly help out our local arts council. So I'm going to talk to them, and I'm going to uh, ask them if they would supply some uniforms for the band, some real nice uniforms. Mm -hmm. That'd be nice. And if I can find the picture here, there's Arthur Pryor. Yeah, I never did see him. I, uh, now, a good friend of a, uh, a fellow named Pryor, he was related to Arthur Pryor. He's mm. died now. He was a good friend of mine. I think Arthur was his uncle or something. Okay. He lived in New Mexico. And there's Herbert Clark. <coughs> yeah, the Herbert Clark had the band at, at Long Beach when I was out there. Yes. Yeah, and boy, he I've got some of his, his, some of his solos that he wrote. And awfully difficult. Oh, brother, he could play some stuff. When we do our job at the temple, we're, there's one called um, By the Shores of the Mighty Pacific. It's a Herbert Clark number. I don't think I have one. And there's several of them, but I mean, it's one that's uh, tremendous. Well, that stars in the velvety sky. He wrote that thing. Yes, that's. You ever see that? Yes, I've oh, heard that's that. Oh, that <laughs> But we're going to perform some of that, and that's the uniform I want. I want us to go back. That's the 1892's first yeah, that'd Susie be nice. uniform. <laughs> see that light yeah. sky blue with deep blue frogs and gold trim. Yeah, that'd be impressive uniform. Certainly, period enough. Now you weren't in the uh, the president's zone, were you? No, no, no. A lot of them uh, say, say, say Marine Band. Well, you stayed in Washington a long time. I said no, and they just no. I don't want to create the wrong impression. I wasn't in the Marine Band. Now there's several of the boys that went from our band to that band. Yeah. And I guess if I'd have, uh, I could have gone if I'd have, you know applied myself a little better. But back in those days, and I guess it's maybe still, you got to go to school before you can get in that band. They had a school back then that you had to go to so so long before they let you in that band. I guess they still got that school. Yes. I mean, you had to have something on the ball to even get in the school. Oh, yeah. They used to send us a lot of their music at Get Dog Beard, you know, and they'd send us out. We got a lot of their music. I was a librarian out there in our band, and I had to look after all that stuff. And we they used to get uh, we used to get a lot of their music. They'd kind of get Dog Beard, of course, they'd get what they wanted. Sure. And they'd send us our music, their music, and we could play just about anything they could. Oh, I believe we couldn't that. play as well, but then we did a darn good job of it. Well, the main band has so much practice time. Oh, well, we practiced all the time, you see. First time we'd get up, we'd have we play color, and then we play guard mount, and then we had about a three-hour rehearsal. We'd rehearse till noon, and then lots of times in the evening we'd have to play a parade. You see, or a concert somewhere, so we were playing all the time. But then we had an old German for a bandmaster, fellow named Arnold. Now he was a good one. And if you played, if you tried, and could even do anything at all, he'd keep you. But uh, if you didn't, see, they had marine. They had marine detachments all over the world, they, and that had all over the Asiatics, and all that a band. And if you didn't uh, come up to stuff or didn't cry, well, you'd find yourself on a boat going to China or Guam or someplace like that. He, he That's kept it for you. He yeah. kept the best men, and not that I was one of the best, but I, I managed to stay there. Sure. <laughs> and that's the way he, he built up his band, and he had a band that wouldn't quit. <laughs> his first chairman, I was, well, I was playing system solo all the time, and uh, most of the time I played first. And sure. I played system solo. There was, there was four of us that played up the first chair, played the, you know, of course the first chair man to usually take the solo and stuff like that. But uh, you played or you stayed in his band, he knew what was in that score. <laughs> you leave out something back here in the horn section, stop the band, you played that another that one to hear that chord. <laughs> I'm going to get some French horn players, or better yet, I'm going to see if I can find two trumpet players who will play E flat horn since they finger the same way.
Because if we had two E-flat horns, four would be better, but if I can only find the first and second, it would help us a lot, out a lot. But we don't sound pretty too bad, I don't think. I'm kind of proud of the way we sound. Yeah, I like it. <laughs> Everyone carries his weight and plays his part, I think. Mm -hmm. And uh, they were excited today. I just couldn't get them to keep it down. But uh, not for long, it was about eight measures at a time. But uh, I'm proud of them. I think it went all very well today. Well, next oh, time. that old man that uh, won a lot. Oh, he went to China, I think, after I got out and I got a, he retired. I got a, I got a letter from him. I said I still got it. He, he wrote to me. I sent him a telegram and he wrote to me. He, he didn't go to you in the service then. He could, he could lower the boom on it. <laughs> we had a guy. Come in there. Oh, he enlisted. He was a good trumpet player, a good trumpet player. In his hometown band, I guess he was about the best. He cut a lot of that stuff. But he thought he was better than he really was. He, and he, uh, he made some kind of a snotty remark about that old man didn't know what he was doing or something. The old man already went, got back to the old man. Well, he didn't say anything, but we were playing. Oh, I believe it was a Barbara Seville or something like that. It had a wicked trumpet trouble in it. And uh, I was playing, uh, I was playing second chair then, I believe, and this guy was playing below me. He's playing the whole my right. The old man fixed it up with me and the first chair man to, to leave him, in the, <laughs> leave him play that solo. Well, he started it off with playing the introduction and the first chair man, he had to do something and then I had to go to the toilet. We had it all rain. And that threw him in the first chair. And the old man, he uh, he tried it. And he, he he couldn't cut it. The old man let him try it three times, and then he lowered the boom on him. He told him what a soul and trouble he was. That, that guy could have crawled under his chair. I bet he could have. But he he had sense enough to to appreciate it, and he finally woke up to the fact that he wasn't the best in the world. He got to be a pretty good, a pretty good, good number. Yeah. A lot of these musicians, you know, they, they get big ideas about them. <laughs> you know that. <laughs> we see that at the college where a kid will come in as a freshman, and maybe he was first chair in his high school band, but he gets up there, and he's just Joe Blow, I mean, you know, and he's just clarinet number 809, and there's somebody there, some sophomore who's, you know, who's been studying with... Uh, Jack Sisson or somebody and just plays him under the table and it usually takes a little less than a semester for him to get very polite and very quiet and uh, suddenly then you can live with him but uh, there is their first nine weeks and they think they're awfully good well it's been a great day I'm so glad you could come up oh I was a big deal I couldn't bring you here and back it out I here a couple about four nights ago I was sick as a horse for a while all night I told her I didn't know whether I was going to be able to make it or not, and then Sue Gee got sick, and she couldn't come, and then I debated whether I'd come or not. Said, well, see, her husband brought me, he was in down the farm, and he said, well, I'll take you up there. I said, well, you think you want to go? I said, well, of course I want to go. But uh, then she drove me from her house on here, he didn't go, and he's going to take me home. Oh, I don't know if he's there, too. Take me back. You're going to uh, Israel, what, on the June? Well, we're talking about it. I, I've sent in my, uh, I've got to talk to my doctor and see what he thinks, but I think I can make it all right. I've always wanted to go over and see that country. I've been to Europe a couple of times, since a lot of I've been to more than I've been over a couple of times since, but uh, I've always wanted to go over the whole land. They've got this little organized, and good friend of Sue wanted us to go with her, and uh, it's, I think it's a small group. I haven't got a whole ticket of where they're going or anything like that. I just had to prepare here about a week ago, too. So, uh, yeah, I'm going to try to go if I can. Uh, the only my main trouble is walking. And uh, I talked to uh, a friend of mine the other day. He'd been over there. He was a better speaker. He went over there last year. And I came very near going to him then, but I wasn't got quite up to it. And I was asking him about the walking, and he said, you don't have to do much walking. So they drive you right up and said, it's a little too much of it. So I said, well, that'd be not, be not going at all. Yeah, yeah, I understand. Well, good. I'm sure it'll be a great trip. I'll let you know. Yeah. Oh, when is this uh, 
When is this concert you're going I'm to play sure out at the exactly. uh, yeah. It'll yeah. either be the last week in May or the first week in June. We're not sure we're right now. We'll, we'll, we'll try and set it so yeah, you can come up through here and play with us. Oh, don't set it on my account. I, 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 I appreciate that, but I might not even get to come. A lot if it's the first week in June, like if we go over there, I probably won't. Right. Well, I think they're, yeah. uh, they're going to leave about the 6th, I think that's the, that's the date. Well, that was the date story, you told me we were going to play. Is that the first week? I think so. I don't know for sure. Uh, I don't have my notebook with me. Uh, we'll put it on a Friday or Saturday, of course. It's hard to Well, I think, I, I'm not sure, but I think that's the date they have set the department in New York. And we'll have to, we have to get to New York on our own. What is the main We'll pay our own fare first. We'll pay our own fare anywhere. Well, you could probably get a direct flight from Dallas. I guess that's where you go from. Yeah, yeah we go from Dallas to New York. And there we go. I, I, I guess it's a non-stop line. I'm sure it is. Dave? What? This young man wants to hear your motor wackle story. Um, what? Would you tell us your motor wackle story? Oh, I wouldn't want to hear that. No, I know it. Tell it anyway. Joe <laughs> hadn't heard it, and I think it's funny. That's hilarious. You're talking about the Dutchman that just left his motorcycle? The Bohemian. The Bohemian. Oh, she's a Bohemian. He's a bohunk. Just walked off and left it in the road. Well, don't left it out in the cotton bag. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, I can tell it. I don't mean. Yeah, go ahead. Well, anyway, we lived there in Fort Worth and had a neighbor over there that lived on that street. He was a bohemian. He told us pretty broken. And he was uh, he he was a uh, work for a neon sign company. This happened several years before, I know it did. And he, uh, he said he, he got him a motor wagon, that's what he told him. And he said uh, he was working, they were putting up a sign in Dallas, putting up some guns and work in Dallas anyway. I know now that Waxahachie, that's where he lived in Dallas, so I'll get a strip there. And he said he was driving back and forth, said he was driving his motor wagon back and forth, said, said he getting pretty good, said he didn't have to hold the horns or nothing. Said, just, Getting good, and he's coming back one night. It's about ten o'clock, gravel road, you know. And he said, um, driving along, sudden button, thinking about something, and said, hit him rock. Said about the biggest two fists. Said motor wackle. He stopped. Said I keep it going. Said skidded for said fifty yards on the back of neck, and he said, said head and elbows, knees. He said. And the damn motor wackle said, come right up and rear up on hind leg and turn around three or four times and fell down and run over in a cotton bag. <laughs> and he said, I get up, he said, uh, wasn't dead. He said, uh, <laughs> I got the ticket to him. He said, wasn't dead. He said, bloody dog. He said, <laughs> he said, he shook his fist. He said, you go to hell, you some numb the bitch. He said, I, <laughs> He said, I ain't about to go out there. He said, he's about four miles into Dallas, and he walked there into Dallas, told him to go on that thing come get it. <laughs> oh, that, well, that bull hunk of tell there. That, that, that. <laughs> <laughs> Motor yeah. What's your favorite childhood memory? What? What's your favorite childhood memory? Oh, Lord. <laughs> I don't know. Oh! Whenever you were water boy, you were going to get rich being the water boy at harvest time up there when they were harvesting the, uh, the wheat harvest. Oh, they get tired of my yarn here. <laughs> I've got that written down, I think. Yeah, I know. Yeah, I, I think so. That's funny. Oh, that was in Idaho. I was about, oh, about eight years old, I guess. And see, my mother died when I was four, and uh, there wasn't any orphanages back in those days. And uh, they just, you know, the neighbors kicked the kids. Uh, we had a neighbor out there at, close to us that uh, had had eight kids, and the old man and old lady died one right after another, and just like stair steps, the kids were. And Dad took three of them to raise, took two of them to raise. You met them. Yeah. And uh, anyway, uh, we, were, we were out the farm and they were thrashing wheat, and I was a water boy, and uh, I got two bits a day. Well, I was getting rich in a hurry, and uh, so we, uh, of course, I, I, they, back in those days, they had the old separator, you know, to hold it in from the field and all that stuff. And so I, I had to sleep with the crew, you know. They slept outdoors with us, one of the crew. I slept with the, the, you know, one of the uh, 
boys and dad raised on them parks, right at the park. They had that old steamer back in those days, old steam engine, you know. And Rastus and I were bedded down just pretty close to this steam engine, and so it was all like after midnight, I guess, or about midnight, and I'd done been asleep. And uh, so Rastus, he woke me up, or I woke up, and he, he told me, he said, uh, I said, uh, uh, if you hear a noise, he said, some kind of hissing noise, he said, once in a great while, says, these engines blow up. And he said, if you hear that noise, said, you better get out of here. I said, they, I said, well, what do they do? Oh, I said, just blow the hole under all the pieces. And they had a neighbor there about four miles from there. I said, well, would it, would it hurt the Harris place? What blown barrel from that? He said, there wouldn't be anything left. So, well, I went back to sleep, and I was thinking about that, and then he went over to that darned engine and opened up a pet cock, and I heard it, and I said, well, well, I come turn out there. I didn't have anything on with a shirt. And I run down to the house and woke them all up and told them to get going, the engine is going to blow up. And of course, they caught the drift pretty quick, but he scared the dickens out of me. And boy, they kidding me about that. Uh, yeah, he did, he did, the whole county just blew up. <laughs> He's, uh, he's one of the kids that dad raised, and he's buried by my dad. We had uh, had three extra lots up there. Last time I not the last time I've been, I've been several trips back to Idaho, and I, I gave him those lots, and he's buried by my mother. So my father and mother both buried him. Dave, tell him about the Chinese laundryman up there in Weezer. Oh, that Yeah, that's the reason. I like that. Oh, well. Uh, they get tired of me of rambling around. Well, we're going to we're going to have to leave. Well, in well, anyway, uh, there was a Chinaman there, and we he, he uh, had a hand laundry. He uh, laundered shirts, you know, and stuff like that. And he was in back of one of the stores there, and uh, I I knew him, seen him, saw him lots of times. He he didn't have a family. He came over from China and said a lot of Chinamen up there then. A lot of Chinese come in and emigrated, you know. I see. Did a lot of this railroad work and yes. all that stuff. But anyway, he he opened up a Chinese laundry there and he did good work. And he made a little money. He was getting along pretty good. And uh, the uh, women of the town and the people of Charitable Institute, they learned that he he pay, he'd donate the ground, you know, and uh, and asked John for a dollar or so for something or other. And most of it is for the church work, you know. He'd always ask him what it was for. And uh, he, they'd tell him it's for Jesus Christ. So <laughs> there one week, there's a bunch of them hit him up, there's four or five of them hit him up the same day. And uh, he come, one of them come around and they, well, what's, what's, what's this for? For Jesus Christ. He shook his head, he said, to what? What am out of this fellow Jesus Christ? said, hell said he old time bloke. <laughs> that actually happened. I love it. Uh, I love it. <laughs> all the time. <laughs> all the time, though. <laughs> we better go.